Hello, and uh, welcome to episode 122 of the Notcast. Uh, despite all information to the contrary, the pandemic is still ongoing. Uh, things may be better, easier, we might be able to leave the house, we might have not socially distant shows, but we're still very, very early days yet. Um, on Tuesday this week, I should have been seeing Mogwai at Prism in Kingston, which was delayed. Uh, that would have been my first post-lockdown show. Didn't happen. Uh, and the next post-lockdown show was meant to be the wedding presents in Brighton. That's been postponed until August 2022. It seems like it's been a long time. And uh, it still feels like we're not quite out of the woods yet. Since today is the 22nd of July 2021. Today is the fourth anniversary, four years ago today. I was seeing you 2 in Dublin perform The Joshua Tree live in full. And um, it's lovely to see the, the Facebook memories and the other memories turn up around the things. There is an element of me looking at those memories and thinking, God, did that happen? We used to leave the house and hug strangers without thinking about it. And we used to sing at the top or bottom of our voices. And we used to go and see bands and everything. And, and it just seems so, so far away from the world we're at now. But hopefully... Uh, nature is healing, as people say. Since today is episode 122, I'm going to do what I normally do, which is I'm going to talk about uh, an album that has a, a meaning and significance from my collection and the singles, reissues and various other bits and bobs that go with it. Today I'm going to talk about the second David Bowie album, Space Oddity. Here is a very, very knackered 1970s edition of it on RCA with the Ziggy Stardust cover uh, and missing a track called Don't Sit Down, although Don't Sit Down is only about 40 seconds long, uh, so not necessarily missing it. The other thing to mention is EU copyright law. So this album was released in November 1969, which meant that towards the end of 1969, a number of copyright extension releases were issued. Uh, in the EU, Copyright for sound recordings generally lasts for 50 years, although it was changed in 2011 to last for 70 years after the date of the recording. And that comes into account up to the last day of the relevant year, which means that if you made a recording on the 1st of January 1969, it was still in copyright until the 31st of December 2019. And if it had not been released by that point, it had been released from copyright, which means if you had a copy of the tape, you could, in theory, release it yourself. Um, this is a grey area, primarily because as a recorded art form, rock is quite immature. Uh, it really only started in 1957 with Elvis Presley. Um, and as we've seen from the value of Elvis Presley records is the values have dropped off as the fans have died. And what you'll see in probably the next few years is bands like Rolling Stones, Pink Floyd, David Bowie, um, Led Zeppelin. Their fan bases, the original fan bases, will start to die out or get dementia. And so if a, if a band or a brand has to maintain its popularity, it has to find ways in which it can maintain and keep that cool cachet of, of relevancy and interest now um elvis didn't do that so the prices of rare elvis things has absolutely plummeted the prices of rare bowie things have absolutely shut up uh, and there's a lot of material which david bowie recorded in 1969 which was released there was a fair chunk which wasn't but the estate of david bowie are fairly confident that the only existing copies of those recordings they have possession of so it then falls out from copyright belonging to the object or the the abstract performance to copyright landing in the object. And if you own the, the object, you have copyright to it, assuming it hasn't been released at that point. Um, the other thing I will mention is that there are some rumours about some behaviour that David Bowie may or may not have partaken in when he was much younger and much stupider. Um, it's fair to say that from my perspective... I like a number of artists whose personal lives or personalities are ones which I wouldn't necessarily get on with. It doesn't mean that I enjoy the music any less. I have to make a value judgment around that. Um, obviously, if you're going to come out tweeting some of the stuff that Ian Brown has been tweeting recently, I'm not going to be on board with that. But that doesn't mean that when I listen to the music, I think, 
mm, that's no good. I just think, okay, I don't agree with him. But with that to one side, today we're going to talk about David Bowie's Space Oddity album, which originally I don't think was called Space Oddity. Um, it originally it was released in November 1969 uh, with a different cover. This is the uh, the cover that's taken from the 1999 EMI remaster, which is the original artwork, which I think was on the original vinyl LP, although it wasn't called Space Oddity until after the song Space Oddity itself became a hit. Um, and it's a it's a good album. It's um, ten songs, I think. Uh, including a song called Don't Sit Down, which was is only 40 seconds long, which was removed from the vinyl pressings from 1972 through to 1990. Don't Sit Down was restored to the running order with the Ryko disc reissues in 1990. Um, and the album from now takes its title and still remains itself being called Space Oddity, even though that wasn't the original title it was released under. So I'm going to talk through Space Oddity, but first, I have to talk through the song, or more correctly, the event that inspired Space Oddity, Stanley Kubrick's 2001 the Space Oddity. Here's an early 2000s DVD edition in a box set. I didn't show you this when I did the Stanley Kubrick episode because I had so much stuff to show you. This uh, version of it contains a, uh, a booklet here. Oh, that's exciting, a collector's collectible booklet, as if some collector collects collectible booklets. And it also contains what it calls is an original cenotype. Um, this is uh, a, a piece of film from a 70 millimeter version, or oh, it's a like a, it's not it's not a 70 millimeter frame, but it's effectively almost like a reproduction of a frame from the movie. Um, I don't know why I haven't got that framed up somewhere in my house. Uh, in the early 2000s, they did a thing called limited edition collector's DVDs, where they just packaged pretty crappy DVDs with a whole bunch of other stuff. So for example, the Blade Runner one had a theatrical poster, the Cenotype, lobby cards, and a shooting draft script. 2001 had a numbered Cenotype. This version here, number 83,846. That was in the days when you sold a lot of stuff. You know, these days things would sell maybe tens of thousands, you know. And if you're uh, Disney, you want to be pushing people towards not even releasing the, the physical version, but keeping the the uh, the version on streaming uh, to maintain the income stream. So there's uh, this here, um, music soundtrack, Cenotype, a word I've never said before and will likely never say again, and a commemorative booklet. Um, and there's the, the DVD release of the film. And there is... The soundtrack stick them all in there 2001 the space odyssey was a big deal when it came out the space odyssey uh it, it in those days films weren't really shown on television television was small the reception was pretty futzy i remember when it would rain and you wouldn't be able to watch what you wanted to watch for example um it was small black and white and it was square so the ideas of having eight foot televisions you know that if, if you had an eight foot television it would cost something like 10 million pounds um, and it would be absolutely huge they also had a thing called crt which is cathode ray tube so these days we're used to televisions being probably about that thick uh, in the days of a cathode ray tube the cathode ray tube was like that that thick so you have televisions that were absolutely enormous you couldn't mount them on the wall uh, and they'd, you'd need at least a foot if not longer, uh, for the gun to shoot the image onto the onto the screen. Um, so watching movies on a television and was was practically practically it was rubbish until at least the eighties when you had VHS tapes, and even after that, it, it probably watching movies on TV was very distinctly a second division, distant and estranged relation to watching the movie at the cinema on the big screen and things like 2001 star wars they would show for years um 2001 i think opened in i think it's may 1968 or thereabouts it played for something like 18 months star wars played for well over a year in the cinema films were played for a long long time the cinema release wasn't going to be the advert for the dvd or for the streaming version on netflix the cinema release was the big deal uh, and there was only a certain number of prints in existence. 
it wasn't like Netflix where you could press a button and you instantly had a copy that you know could be endlessly replicated at no cost. And Space Odyssey was a huge, huge, huge film. And I think that it, it really kind of inspired David to write the Space Odyssey song. Um, now, there's a lot of co correlations between 2001, A Space Odyssey, and the Space Odyssey song. You think about the, I think there was a, a an allegory in, in the Space Odyssey as a song where he sings about here I am floating in a tin can. Uh, planet Earth is blue and there's nothing that you can do. And when he sings about that, he's also kind of singing about the fact that Frank Paul, who's the astronaut who dies in 2001, is sat alone in a spacesuit, flies, flying through the, flying, floating, flying through the void of space, separated from everything around him. And around about the time that David wrote it, um, he also went through one of the, the major breakups of his life, uh, from a, a woman called, I think, Hermione, and um, who, who went off to, to do something else, which was a, something that he referenced even right at the end of his career by wearing a T-shirt with the name of the play or the film that she was went to work on when they split up, almost kind of saying everything that's happened after this is the result of that decision, because obviously when you're a person and you go through a split-up you, you, or, or a separation, you kind of like have a theory, you have like an idea that your life will go from one place to another, and then all of a sudden you find that actually you have to take a left turn, you're going in a different direction, you know, you become somebody else. Who can I be now? Where are we now? These are all the kind of questions which are happening when, when someone uh, splits up with somebody else. So Space Oddity, uh, released in November 1969, was, I think, probably David's attempt to step outside of the initial kind of work that he was doing. So his first album, as, as I mentioned previously, was uh, very much about imagined experience, not real experience, and around him kind of um, portraying things that he may not necessarily have had any actual experience of in his own life, but more things and observations that he'd seen. Now, the, I read a, uh, a quote by Michael Stipe uh, uh, that, he, that he wrote about someone's interpretation of his song. He said, the mistake that you've made is you've inserted me into the song. Now, from a creative point of view, if you listen to Space Oddity and, and you did so completely, uh, literally, you know, you would think that David Bowie had actually been an astronaut in space. Well, clearly, obviously, he hadn't. He's writing a story about an imagined set of events. But they're things and feelings which you're using an allegory to create. In much the same way as the X-Men movies are, are very much allegories around, for example, homophobia or, or, or fear of, of religion or xenophobia or different countries. Space Oddity is him writing about the loneliness that he felt, I think, when, when he, he, he split up with someone that he was clearly very, very affectionate around. Um, so this is the, the inner sleeve here. Uh, as you can tell, and I've mentioned before, um, the inner sleeves, the vinyl themselves, were, were pretty cheap and pretty thin. Um, and these were largely because of money. And if they could make a tiny bit more profit, good God, you can bet they're going to do that, aren't they? So they're going to make the vinyl sleeve a little thin because no one was thinking about, well, what's this album going to be like in 50 years' time? You know, I don't even know. Some days people would write their names in the records so they could take them to parties and they wouldn't get stolen when they went to the parties. Uh, so this one clearly never went to any parties because no one's ever written their name in it. Uh, but... Um, Space Oddity, this is a, a repackage. I'm just going to check the copyright date on here. I think it's 1972. Yeah, so this version is 1972. This is an American edition printed in the USA. So it's got the Ziggy Stardust era photograph on, which replaces the original photograph. It's got the Ziggy Stardust era photograph on the back as well. Now, what you, you, you'd find is if you look at paperbacks, for example, paperbacks have always got new covers, new art, new paintings, new designs. Albums very, very rarely get given new covers when they're repressed or reissued, unless your name is Morrissey. Um, and, you know, it, uh, these days, changing the cover art is an integral part of the, inte the cover art is the integral part of the design of the album. So the album is effectively what we're holding here is a mass produced work of art. Um, it happens to be a vinyl disc and the vinyl disc is the delivery mechanism for the music itself. But it's the whole thing is an experience. Uh, now, I'm going to sound like one of these old men tilting at windmills, yelling at clouds and telling you about how I remember when it was all cassettes around here. Um, but Space Oddity is, you know, it, it was never designed to have this cover. It was never designed to have 
uh, don't sit down taken out of it. It was never designed to be anything other than, than seen and heard and experienced in the way in which it was. But record companies would frequently, because as far as they were concerned, records were just the same as baked beans. They're a product and they're to be sold to you. And it doesn't matter if the picture is of David Bowie three years later when he's famous. What matters is we can get people to pay money for this and we can then turn that money into coke that goes up record executives' noses and into their mansions and definitely not into the bank accounts of the people that actually did the work. As um, I think it's AMC, uh, will have known after they settled with Frank Darabont for over $200 million uh, around not paying him adequate and correct royalties for The Walking Dead. Uh, one rule is don't fuck with the talent because the, ta the talent is there because it creates things that you can't uh, and people need to respect that. And also I think a lot of record labels have the view that artists are, are stupid idiot working class oiks that can't read their way through a contract. And then they get really, really annoyed and upset when people actually hold them to the deal on which they signed. They rely on the artist being impoverished so they can continue to rip them off. And by the way, Jeff Bezos, you are not a rocket man. You are a tax-dodging tax guy who has never created anything of any worth to anybody. Not that you're watching this, and I don't even know why I said that. Um, I think Space Oddity is a really, really good album. It's a, it's a much better second album than the first album would have indicated to you. And certainly at the, the time when it was uh, released, um, it was, I think, what, David was 22, 23. I couldn't have written an album anywhere near as good as this at 22 or 23. Maybe by the age of 27, if I'd really, really tried, I could get vaguely near it. Uh, and that's that's not trying to be arrogant about it. I, just, I know I couldn't have done this at 22, 23. That the man had talent, he had drive, ambition. He wrote a lot of songs for this album, even though there's only what nine, ten songs on this, plus a couple of B sides. He wrote a lot, a lot of songs uh, for this album, and we we get to hear probably 90% of them through the various copyright extension box sets and releases after the fact um i think it's a, a really good record and it's got a degree of of awareness around the real world and real life lived experience that comes through the songs that you otherwise you definitely didn't have on the first album the first album sounded like a record made by a child this one sounds like it's a record made by someone who is becoming a man and becoming himself now there's some some brilliant songs on here by the way um there's also God Knows I'm Good, which is not a good song at all. Um, but, you know, Janine, An Occasional Dream. Um, I think Memory of a Free Festival is really good. It's probably a bit too long. Uh, Signet Committee is, is great. You, know, you can really tell. There wasn't a huge amount of money in this. This record sold 5,025 copies in the first four months of its release. And in those days, hit albums sold a million. They didn't sell 4,000 copies or 5,000 copies. And you've got to remember that, you know, there's, there's um, nowadays you put out an album and if you sell 5,000 copies, that's a lot of records, obviously because of streaming and the other options which you've got. In those days, 5,000 was put bluntly, bugger all, um, but there was Space Oddity, which was a novelty single. It's the song that I think a lot of people start their, their listening david bowie with uh, bearing in mind he's been making records for five years at this point he's already done the dram album he's done dozens of singles with what feels like trillions of bands he's been working hard and long for a long period of time just pouring out songs trying to find something that will stick it might be mime it might be movies it might be music you know and by the way if you took david bowie's stage career or acting career that on itself is well worth you know, evaluating and thinking about as just a really, really good actor who was very well loved. But then you throw in all the records as well, and you kind of go, there's, there's very little that the man couldn't do apart from play drums, by the sound of it. Certainly could play saxophone better than I can sing. Um, but there's uh, you know, about over the 30 albums and the 25 live albums and the 14 compilations and the 450 or so David Bowie songs, you know, the fact that there's there's some classics here when he's writing when he's 22, 23 is that he, he really, really wanted to make it work. So the, the first kind of big single uh, that was a big hit, really, uh, was Space Oddity. Um, here was the 1975 reissue, which I think went alongside the release of the Changes Bo One Bowie compilation. Although, of course, I could be wrong. 
I should point out there are two types of David Bowie fans. There are the people that remember absolutely everything about the very day that he moved into the house in Beckenham, which room he stayed in, and how many uh, lasagnas he's eaten through the whole of his life. I ain't one of those guys. I'm someone that talks about what the music means to me and my experience and relationship to it, by the way. So if you're looking for a bi biographical breakdown of his life, you probably should read some other books or watch some other podcasts. Um, but this is uh, Space Oddity, the 1975 or so, maybe 1970, no, 1974 RCA Records edition and space odyssey i mean it's, it's a novelty single you know it's uh you know pictures of matchstick men set in space in that respect it's not the the best song that he was ever going to do and if it was the only song that he would ever have released that would have been a hit uh what a, what a tragic understatement because everyone would go do you remember that guy that did that weird song space oddity who you know made a couple more records and then disappeared this is the other stuff that he made and you'd be listening to things like changes and you go how come nobody knows all of this stuff luckily History proves us right. Um, this stuff has stood the test of time, although Space Oddity has a song alongside its very own stylophone solo and the appearance of Rick Wakeman. It's, um, it's a novelty song. Yeah, it's a novelty song in the same way that The Laughing Gnome is a novelty song. It's just a more maudlin version of the same type of, of, of novelty. Uh, it's a great song, by the way. And this, this seven inch of um, Space Oddity uh, is backed with Changes. And uh, a second track on a three-track seven-inch, uh, previously unreleased, Velvet Goldmine. Hard to believe, actually, that Bo's Velvet Goldmine didn't come out until a number of years after it was released. And the second single from the album, uh, it intended as a follow-up, um, was originally going to be uh, a song called, um, I think, London by Tata. And then he decided not to do that version and not to release that. So the second single he released was... Uh, the Prettiest Star. This is the, the version of Time, backed with The Prettiest Star, that was uh, sold from the Bowie Museum in Brooklyn. And they had some leftover stock at the end of the exhibition. You can bet I paid $15 to get this one imported into the UK. Uh, it doesn't tell me which version of The Prettiest Star it is, because The Prettiest Star was re-recorded. Uh, for the album um, and Space Oddity by the way was also re-recorded in 1979 um, here is a, a single or a, a reissue single of Alabama Song backed with the re-recording of Space Oddity and Space Oddity was recorded in 1979 uh, for a television appearance on the Kenny Everett show with uh, the band which uh, David was considering touring with following the release of the, the relevant album, uh, which I think was Lodger. He also re recorded a couple of other songs um, to, for the soundtrack for the Kenny Everett TV appearance, which were the only songs which he did because then John Lennon was murdered and David decided not to tour. So there's a re-recording of Space Oddity from 1979, uh, which is fascinating and, and well worth hearing. Of course, as we move into the, the CD era, uh, there's a couple of other things which have come out from the album. Uh, the first one, is here is a, an appalling compilation record called Bowie Rare, uh, which David Bowie absolutely hated, and quite rightly so. Uh, this has a, a, an Italian language version of Space Oddity called Regazza Solo, Regazza Sola, which I think translates as Lonely Boy, Lonely Girl, and he sang the lyrics in Italian, um, and they're completely different. They have a completely different meaning, and he committed to it and sang it. The rest of the album is non-album B-sides, uh, by and large, that have not been on any other records. Um, and this was released, I think, in probably 1982 or thereabouts, with a then-contemporary photograph of Bowie. The idea being is that it would fool you into thinking, ah, this is the modern stuff that we like. Uh, this might have come out actually after the release of... It definitely came out after the release of Crystal Japan. But it might have come out at the same time as, as Baal or possibly Let's Dance. Never been on CD that I know of. Um, and David Bowie hates it because he thought that using a, a contemporary picture of him in 1983 to advertise recordings made between 1970 and 1981, none of which he'd regarded to be good enough to go on an album, was exploitative. And um, given the amount of reissues, repackaging, picture discs and other things which he released in his lifetime, uh, to say that this was too exploitative was really quite a strong statement indeed. Um, on the reissue front, the next thing that we had from the album, 
uh, was released in 1990. And oh boy, is this a beauty. This is the uh, the sound and vision Ryko disc box set. Uh, when we get to 1990, I will talk through this beastie in more detail. Uh, this version, three CDs plus a video CD, which is kind of like a DVD, but much crapper. Um, and the, uh, the the Sound and Vision box set features the uh, previously unreleased demo version of Space Oddity, more of which on that later. Uh, the B-side version of Wide-Eyed Boy from Free Cloud, the single version of The Prettiest Star, uh, and the previously unreleased version of London by Tata, which was originally intended to come out as a potential follow-up to the Space Oddity single itself. Um, also going to point out, this is one of the very, very nicest packages which there is, primarily because you open it up and there's a uh, the, the picture of David that you can see uh, printed onto the frosted kind of PVC plastic pane that sits on the the box set itself apparently only one manufacturer in the world was able to produce that at the time that it was released uh, pretty exciting i think depending on your point of view really it went a little quiet the Ryko disc issues came out in 1990 so those were the first official david bowie cd editions of the albums um, there'd been some flat transfers of his catalogue in a somewhat haphazard fashion on RCA records. Um, mastering snobs will argue until the cows come home about those. Uh, but the, the Ryko disc version of Space Oddity was the first time that a CD version of the album had been officially signed off by David Bowie, as opposed to somebody picking out some master tapes and sticking it onto a CD. Um, there was also the, the 1999 uh, EMI remasters of his albums um, when he was... Uh, going back into being cool again. These were uh, quite loud, quite compressed, quite brick-walled, and not really a fan of the mastering of these albums at all. Now, the year 2000 brought the first major issue of um, David's archival material, in my opinion, apart from the Sound and Vision of Ryko disc sets, Bowie at the Beeb. And Bowie at the Beeb was a dull CD of radio sessions. Uh, it's called The Best Of, the BBC. It's certainly not all the BBC sessions because some of those sessions have been lost. And also, what would you stick on the box sets in 2019 if you couldn't get all of your BBC recordings? But this does feature uh, studio recordings or live in the studio recordings at the BBC's fantastic Made of Ale studio, uh, which I had the good fortune to see John Grant with. Uh, in, in 2018, I think Made of Ale is now being redeveloped like everything in London, to be a luxury flat for contemporary and spacious urban living and a snip at an affordable half a million pounds for a box. Um, but uh, in the meantime, before that happened, uh, David Bowie recorded in the basement. Uh, there are four made or five made of ale studios. Uh, incidentally, I think it might have been Bing Crosby recorded his last ever session at the made of ale studios. Um, but uh, that's a different story for a considerably older clientele and target audience, and certainly not one I'm going to talk about too much. Um, but Bowie at the Beeb is a best-of compilation of the radio sessions uh, that was released in the year 2000. So even whilst David, in the year 2000, was looking forward, he was doing his, his, his Glastonbury greatest hits set, and he was, you know, very, very much looking forward and forward-thinking. At the same point, he was also looking back. So Bowie at the Beeb which didn't get a vinyl release until 2016, I think. Uh, initial versions of Bowie at the Beeb, by the way, come with a, an extra live set recorded at the BBC Theatre. Again, this might be made of ale, or it might be somewhere else, uh, the day after he played Glastonbury. No, the BBC Radio Theatre. Um, and there's only 16, 15 songs from that, primarily because David was having voice troubles and so he didn't sing all of the songs and he didn't sing all of the songs particularly well. Bowie at the Beep is an absolutely essential purchase, by the way. Uh, it's got a number of, of really interesting performances and songs on it. There are three songs on Bowie at the Beep which you can't get on any uh, Bowie studio album in a studio recorded fashion. Uh, and those are um, Looking for a Friend, uh, which I'll come to in a later episode, 
um, white light, white heat, and waiting for the man. Those last two being cover versions of, of the Velvet Underground. Um, David very clearly had his finger on the pulse there. But the, the, the radio session that's on here um, for DLT is released in full on the 2009 version of the album. This is a double CD version of the album, um, which features the demo of Space Oddity recorded with John Hutch Hutchinson, um, who also played rhythm guitar in the Spiders from Mars live, uh, a demo of An Occasional Dream, the B-side version of Wild Eyed Boy from Free Cloud, uh, BBC session versions of Let Me Sleep Beside You, Unwashed and Slightly Dazed, Janine, uh, the unreleased studio recording of London by Tata and the single version of The Prettiest Star, as well as the B-sides, Conversation Piece, uh, versions of Memory of a Free F Festival, Parts 1 and Parts 2, um, a alternate mix of Wide Eyed Boy from Free Cloud, an alternate mix of, of Memory of a Free Festival, an alternate mix of London by Tata, um, and also um, the the full version of Regaza Solo, Regaza Solo. Now the there's also alternate mixes of a number of album tracks that appear on the Conversation Piece box set, uh, but I do not have Conversation Piece. Um, which I will explain later. Um, there's also this box set, David Bowie, Five Years. This contains all the studio albums, all the, the live albums um, released from the period in the five years running 1969 to 1973. The, uh, there's the, the Space Oddity version in a vinyl replica sleeve. Uh, and then also on the, on the recall disc, uh, there's a number of single only tracks such as the Space Oddity, Wild Eyed Boy from Free Cloud, uh, and so on and so forth. So almost all of the single tracks that were judged and fit good enough for release. There's very little unreleased material on the Recall albums, by the way. It's effectively is a you know a scoop up of the A's and B's. Um, if you remember way back in the dim and distant past when I talked about David Bowie counterfeit box sets, this David Bowie box set is the unofficial Chinese version. Uh, which I highlight in another episode around how to detect the differences between the counterfeits and the real things. But hopefully, as you will notice, I've spent plenty of money on David Bowie over the years, and uh, it, I'm okay with where we were. It went a little quiet after David's death in regards to the earlier material, until we got to the release of, of this, uh, the unexpected spying through a keyhole copyright extension seven inch box set which was released in about april 2019 at an exploitative price it was quite quite expensive indeed it recorded between november 1968 and january 1969 with john hutch hutchinson um, this was four seven inch singles alongside a postcard and a little uh, information booklet around what was on each one of those seven inches so in order to get the, the copyright for these effectively one way of lodging copyright was to uh, get a record and to send a copy of it to yourself in a sealed envelope uh, the postmark would be proof of the date of its recording and its existence and as long as you didn't open it unless it went to court you had a copy of the tape or the recording, or in this case, the acetate, seven inches, which you could then prove were yours. So effectively, these were copyright extension uh, devices at the time. Um, now, these were published on, I think, what they were called, acetates. Acetates are a, a, an inferior form of vinyl that's used effectively for test pressing. The needle wears away the sound every time that you play an acetate. So you can play an acetate maybe 10 times. Uh, they're cheaper, quicker, easier, ideal for test pressings, actually. And um, so the original versions, I think, were, 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 were called, uh, I think, you know, EMI discs or whatever. They've replaced that with a very similar logo that calls it a Bowie disc. These are effectively replicas on proper vinyl of the seven inches which were, were used at the time i think um this is uh, contains um angel angel grubby face and two versions of, of, of space oddity but i really should start at the beginning because the beginning is not only a very delicate time according to the best version of june um, the beginning is the first track mother gray um, backed with in the heat of the morning and in the heat of the morning is a, a song that l later appears um, on other releases um, disc two is Goodbye 3D 
and Love is All Around. I've got these in the wrong order. I should have checked these before I did this. So there's Goodbye 3D. Uh, and there's Love All Around. Uh, uh, Love All Around is a song that wasn't even rumoured as existing at the time until it was announced uh, that it came out. And Love All Around is the one that gives this set its title, Spying Through a Keyhole. Um, and the third 7-inch is London by Tata and Angel, Angel Bloody Face. Um, if you have an opportunity to listen to uh, the Adam and Joe podcast, by the way, uh, Adam Buxton is a huge David Bowie fan, as is Joe Cornish. Uh, they did record, when these songs were announced, their own versions, their fake Bowies. Uh, they did a, a wonderful fake demo of Angel Angel Grubby Face, uh, which is probably better, actually, than the version that's on here. And you also get the first recordings of Space Oddity. Um, on a four times seven inch box set at the time this was released this was far too expensive uh, i think people bought them or put them on sale because they thought they would sell them uh, it really was a cash grab by the estate uh, the value of these and the cost of these has has fallen dramatically you can pick these up for about 10 pounds now if you uh, if you look carefully and are patient and the second seven inch box set which again followed roughly the same format was called the Clareville Ro Grove demos recorded in David's house at Clareville Grove uh, it's him a tape recorder uh, John Hutch Hutchinson and uh, they're, they're playing the songs in a bedroom um, to, to tape and then, you know, mailing them to themselves to prove that those songs really exist. Uh, he's had a haircut here because he appeared in, I think, a, uh, a brief blink and you'll miss it moment where he gets punched in a film called, I think, The Virgin Soldiers. Um, and obviously, uh, fame at any cost. Here is a, a photograph of, of David and Hutch and a child who you can hear talking. Uh, there's some explanatory text here as well. Again, I'm not going to pretend to have uh, read and memorised this. Um, again, these were, were sold and they, they were really, really expensive when these sets were, were first released. You know, so like £30 or something, which is absurd. Um, but as we know, David was uh, and his estate are certainly not, not shy of trying to separate us from our cash. Again, following the, the format that the other ones have got, replicating the, the acetate um, demo discs here but they're called bowie discs it has uh, yet another demo of space oddity backed with lover to the dawn i think the early part of lover to the dawn was rewritten and turned into a uh, signet committee actually although i could be wrong um, there's only so much space in my brain and i can't remember it all uh, disc two is backed with chingling and the demo version of occasional dream the demo version of occasional dream that you saw on the sound and vision box set by the way here version on this set which I showed you a minute ago and then the third and the last of the seven inch bootleg rip-off discs is uh, let me sleep beside you and life is a circus again on a seven inch uh, there and again these were like 30 quid when they came out for three seven inch singles I, I don't know anybody who actually sat down and listened to them and was excited by them the estate might have said it was an exciting release because it was six previously unreleased david bowie songs from the 60s but realistically if eu copyright lasted for 100 years instead of 50 years i can guarantee you that these wouldn't exist we wouldn't own them we wouldn't be listening to them at all and in any event it's most definitely these releases would have been in the only release when i'm dead pile uh, apparently the estate open a letter every year from david that says this is what i want you to release year six year seven after my death um and sure certainly you know year 1969 they probably thought in 2019 we want to release seven seven inches of me playing acoustic demo versions of songs and charge the earth for them the next release, again in uh, 2019, was the uh, the Mercury Years uh, Demos LP. When this came out, this was priced at a frankly absurd and obscene £91.99. Uh, I'd like to thank my patience and my tight wallet for buying it for £20 two years after release uh, from Amazon. Primarily probably because they got them piled high thinking people will buy any old shit with the word David Bowie written on it. Well, guess what, suckers? It ain't. And that's why there's no, there's not, they're not doing the 7-inch picture discs anymore. The Mercury Demos is effectively um, a, a replica of the, the Mercury Demos that they recorded when they were under consideration 
for Mercury Records. So there's one LP in here, which for £91.99 roughly translates to about £3 a minute of music. So this is the original uh, reel-to-reel -reel tape. Uh, and then there's the, the seven inch here, which features David's handwritten notes. Again, replicating the, the Bowie disc uh, acetate format, but this time for a 12 inch with handwritten labels. It is in mono, it is uh, one guy, well, two guys, two guitars, two voices, performing a number of unreleased songs in a bedroom in South London, um, and trying desperately not to wake anybody up. The other major sin that this box set conducts is that there's, there's actually, they've just tried to pad out and make it feel more expensive by putting in what feels like about two centimetres of foam padding to make it feel thicker than it actually is. There's no reason for that to be there, apart from to make you think that if you're buying a box set that's an inch thick, it must be worth £91.99 as opposed to anything else. The, the set also contains, hang on a second, uh, a envelope with photographs and text. Um, here's yeah, some text. Here's some some photos, and here's a couple of contact sheets of photographs from the same thing. Again, absolutely no idea why this costs so much. It most definitely was not worth it. In fact, if there was anything that this should have been called, it should have taken its name in the Monty Python compilation release the final rip-off. They clearly must have thought, the estate, that we just had more time and money than sense. And what we desperately, desperately wanted to do was spend nearly £100 on a 12-inch and a, 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 a couple of laminated photographs. Put any old tat on it, mate, and we'll sell it. That's absolutely fine. Uh, which, of course, it absolutely isn't. Because if you bought the two 7-inch box sets and you bought this and you've got Space Oddity and you've got it on the 2-CD version, there really is very, very little reason for you to buy the 5-disc set of Conversation Piece, which, by the way, retails for a wallet-hurting £75. So if you bought everything from the album uh, in the year 2019, yes, you would have paid about £30 for that. You would have paid about £30 for this. You would have paid about £90 for this, plus £75 for the Conversation Piece 5-CD box set. So you will have paid somewhere in the region of £250 to get the same contents but spread over a huge number of additional releases that you don't need i mean even the vinyl versions alone would have come to something like 160 pounds plus the 75 pounds from the uh, the other version that came out so conversation piece by the way if you can find it cheap buy it absolutely great you certainly don't need all of those releases on vinyl but conversation piece contains seven new demo recordings and that is demo versions of songs April's Tooth of Gold, uh, the the something something, the Reverend Raymond Brown, the very last one of the DRAM style songs about imaginary people and imaginary lives, uh, a demo version of When I'm Five, uh, a demo version of Animal Farm, Conversation Piece, Jerusalem and a song called Hole in the Ground, previously unreleased recordings of London by Tartar and Space Oddity, even though by the way you've got Space Oddity on um let's just check and see if we got it on this yes you've got space oddity on here you've got a demo on here you've got um two demos on here you've got a fourth demo on here so you've already been released there already five demos of, of space oddity have been released and there's an extra there's an extra version on the box set so you've got to buy it uh, and then also there's alternate mixes of um janine occasional dream uh and, and one other song the name of which i've forgotten um let me see if I can recall what it is, is Letter to Hermione. And, but there's really no reason for that. And there's also a, a Tony Visconti 2019 remix on the Conversation Piece box set. Um, the remix almost definitely exists not to correct a, a, a faulty mix or any problems with the mix that previously happened, but largely to provide a new mix of the album that could therefore extend the copyright of the album for an extra 50 years. There is no other reason for a Tony Visconti 2019 remix of Space Oddity. I don't think they got the first album wrong, and I think the remix had so little to it that, frankly, it, it might as well just be called the copyright copyright extension remix and be done with it and just be honest about it guys um, so that's the the second David Bowie album which I wasn't expecting to talk about for quite so long um, I thought 
to be honest, um, that I might do all of the albums on this box set in 45 minutes. Um, I think I'm going to have to rethink that. Um, I think this might take a little bit longer than I thought. Luckily, um, there are 13 other David Bowie uh, podcasts which are available for you if this one isn't one that you like. Uh, in the meantime, since it is still the 22nd of July 2021, I'm going to wrap up here. It's a Thursday. It's been a very long week. I'm very tired. I'm quite grumpy. Hopefully none of you can tell that. Um, but I'm going to wrap up here and I'm going to um, talk about probably... An, uh, another album next time that I do one of these. I don't know when that's going to be. Uh, it's probably going to be Monday. Um, although, obviously, if you're watching this six months in the future, I will have already done it. So you so you know more than I do. Um, it's like Back to the Future. I've been to the future. It's absolutely great. Well, I'm going to wrap up here. Uh, I'm going to show you the uh, the David Bowie stuff I've got I've bought a lot of David Bowie stuff more stuff than I should have bought because he's released more formats and more weird versions than anybody should really have done for one album his estate have really milked the teats of this until there's nothing but bones and dust and I think I don't need to buy conversation piece I think that's a little bit too far for me anyway next time I talk about David Bowie I'm going to talk about his next album The Man Who Sold the World which was released in November. 1970 in the US. Uh, surprising that Space Odyssey only sold 5,025 copies in the first four months of release. It's definitely sold lots since then. Take care of yourselves and each other. Stay beautiful. Be lovely in the comments and I'll see you soon. Thank you for your time. Bye.